Good morning and welcome to Virtual Church. Uh, it's another beautiful day in paradise. Well, maybe it's not quite paradise, but uh, the sun is shining and we are so glad that you have joined us. We want to welcome you to this virtual service. My name is Les Markham. I'm one of the pastors here at Surrey Pentecostal Church. We lovingly call it the Spa Church. And we want to say that uh, you are so glad, we are so glad that you have come to join us today. Pastor Wes would like to extend his greetings. He is in self-imposed isolation because he took a little mini vacation down in the U.S. just before all of this broke loose. But he does send his greetings and he is doing fine. So uh, we continue to pray for him. We will not be meeting again in public services until April, but uh, the church office is open and you can contact us anytime from 8.30 to 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, when we, as soon as we get clearance from the health authorities, we will be meeting again in person. In the meantime, we will be in connection through social media. For some of you golden agers like myself, this is a little bit of a stretch, a little bit of a challenge, but for those who are younger, this is a walk in the park. You're familiar with this type of connection all the time. Just a couple of announcements at this time. Uh, we do encourage you to continue giving. Uh, you can send your offerings in through text messaging or you can drop it off anytime here during our office hours. There will be prayer here at the church every day between 11 and 12, uh, between 11 a.m. and noon, uh, here in the prayer room, and we're going to keep our distance from one another, but uh, I'm so glad that God is not isolated, and he's always available to answer our prayers. So if you're available to join us, that's at 11 o'clock every morning. Uh, we also are looking at a couple of prayer walks uh, maybe in the neighborhood to pray for our neighbors. So uh, keep that in mind and we'll give you more information about that shortly. Every morning, Pastor Wes would like to do devotions with you uh, via the social media. So at 8.30 every morning, Pastor Wes will be sharing a devotion and you might want to take advantage of that. I'm sure it will be a blessing. Uh, we just want to encourage you to keep in touch even though we are isolated in many ways uh, we can still connect with one another and in some ways maybe this is even more important in these days when we are isolated in some ways from one another so i'd like to start this morning by asking the lord's blessing so would you join me in prayer our father in heaven we thank you that uh, you are the all-knowing and all-powerful God who is able to help us in every situation. And so, Lord, this morning we are saying a special prayer for those who have been infected. We do pray for medical people that you will keep them safe. Thank you for their services. And Lord, we do pray for those in positions of authority, those in governments, that you would give them wisdom in knowing what kind of direction to give us. Heavenly Father, we do commit ourselves to your loving care. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that wherever my audience might be, wherever this listener is, that they would sense your presence and that your holy word would speak to them today. We just want to commit this time to you, Lord, and ask for your presence with each one of us, wherever we might be. We ask it in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, it's a new world. It's a different day. Just a couple of months ago, when we celebrated the new year, who would have guessed that this would be the situation in such a short time? How many times in the last month have you heard the word unprecedented crisis? And how many of you would have been somewhat unfamiliar with the term social distancing? This little virus has changed the way we think and the way we act towards one another. It's amazing, isn't it, 
that something that is so small that we cannot even see it with the human eye could bring the whole world to a grinding halt. It has created a culture of crisis, a climate of fear and anxiety, and a time when many people are concerned about self-preservation. I was listening to the news this past week, and one commentator described it as a time of terror and despair. People are wondering how they're going to pay their rent. Can they afford to pay the mortgage? And people are even fighting over toilet paper. And I am informed that the meat counters are getting a little bit low. This is not only a time for self-isolation, it's also a time for self-examination. It's a time for personal reflection. Maybe it's a good time to turn off the television, there's no sports anyway, and maybe turn off the iPhone and just spend a little time evaluating what really is important in life. What are our true and lasting values? It's a time for positive action, or in some cases, positive inaction. Not everybody has been infected by this virus, but everyone in one way or another has been affected. COVID-19 is dangerous because it's so contagious. But I want to share with you this morning another contagion, not a physical problem, but a spiritual disease. Actually, spiritual disease is more da dangerous and deadly than a physical disease, and, and oftentimes it's harder to discern. Here at Surrey Pentecostal Church, we have been doing a study, a series, in the book of Jude. Now, you might be asking yourself, the book of Jude, where in the world is that? Well, it's in the Bible. But it happens to be one of the least read, least known, and most neglected books in the whole Bible. And maybe that's because it's such a short book. It's just one page. So if two pages of your Bible happen to get stuck together, you could totally miss it. Maybe it's not read a lot because it's very near the end of the Bible, and if you start reading at the start, you might not make it all the way through. In fact, if you're just a new Bible reader, I would encourage you to start maybe in the New Testament in the Gospel of John. Some people really have a hard time working through some of those, test those stories in the Old Testament. Well, maybe Jude has been avoided, because the author speaks out so strongly against sin and against false teachers in the church. The book of Jude is a burning denunciation of those who would bring error into the church of Jesus. If you have a Bible, I would encourage you to get it and maybe open it at this time to the book of Jude, because that's where we will be focusing our study. The first verse of Jude says, that this book was written by a man named Jude. Now fancy that. Isn't that a surprise? Jude was written by Jude. Some of the books in the Bible are, are named after those first readers, like Romans and Corinthians, but some are named after the person who wrote them, and that's the case with Jude. Now in the first century, Jude or Judas was a very common name in the nation of Israel, and maybe that's because one of their national heroes was a man by the name of Judas Maccabees. But uh, after the perfidy of Judas Iscariot, when one of the disciples of Jesus betrayed the Lord, uh, Judas did not become such a popular name in the early church. And Jude is actually the English form of the word Judah or Judas, and so we have Jude. Jude is it. And verse 1 in, the, in this book tells us that Jude was a brother of James. Now James was a half-brother of Jesus, which means that Jude also was a half-brother of Jesus. But uh, he does not make a lot of that in his book. He doesn't name drop. He doesn't say, I guess you should listen to me because I am a half-brother of Jesus. But rather, in verse 1, he calls himself a servant of the Lord. 
he comes to us in this book in the spirit of humility. And maybe we could use a little bit more of that attitude in our world today. And maybe it behooves all of us to exemplify a little bit more of this trait. Perhaps uh, COVID-19 has illustrated to us, we don't know everything about everything. And maybe we're not quite as much in control of everything as we sometimes might like to think. Well then, I like the way Jude introduces his readers, readers in verse 1. He says they are called by God. That means God has taken the initiative. God has demonstrated his leadership by coming to us first. He calls us. The question really is, how do we respond to God's initiative? How do we react to God's call upon our lives? And then he says we are loved by God. God is love. It's his basic characteristic. And so he, this verse shows us the compassion and the care that God has for each one of us. And then he says in that verse, we are kept by God. This assures us of God's power to protect us from evil and harm. Now the primary reference is to our spiritual well-being because he says we are kept in Christ or we are kept by Christ. But I believe that this promise of God has ramifications in all areas of our life, even with COVID-19. God is our refuge. God is our fortress. God is our source of strength. And our hope and trust is in God. So our lives should be directed more by the love of God than by any disease that happens to come our way. Now, if you're wondering why Jude wrote this book, he shares his purpose with us in verse 3 when he says he wanted to write about salvation, God's salvation. What a wonderful topic. What a wonderful theme. What a wonderful subject that would be. But Jude feels compelled rather to share with us his concern that false teaching is working its way into the church. A spiritual virus has inflicted itself upon the body of Christ. You see, our religious communities are susceptible to a spiritual virus just as our physical bodies are subject to a physical virus. It's easier sometimes, though, to recognize an ailment that afflicts us in our stomach or in our lungs than it is to identify a problem with our worship or our witness. Mm -hmm. So Jude becomes a spiritual whistleblower. He says to his readers and to us, you have a spiritual tummy ache. You have a problem that needs to be identified and addressed. So Jude takes out his spiritual stethoscope and he gives his spiritual diagnosis. You are in danger, he says, of COVID-19. Now, COVID-19 is a physical affliction. I'm identifying COVID-20 as a spiritual problem that we could possibly face. By the way, did you know that Corona actually means crown? This is a crown virus that we are confronted with. So how do people react when they get an awareness that there is a spiritual pandemic? Well, some say it's not really that big of a deal. It's not really such a serious problem. There's nothing really that wrong. We're doing okay. Uh, we're probably better off than some other people. But in the book of Revelation, in chapters 2 and 3, Jesus addresses himself to some of the churches, and he says, you think you're rich, but you're really poor. You think you're healthy, but you're really sick. And you need to wake up and be alert to the problem that really does exist. And Jude, Jude says to us, I'm laying this out as clearly as I know how, and I'm speaking to you as plainly as I can. There is a problem. There is a spiritual virus that is infecting the church, and we need to be aware of that. He is warning us that this error could lead us into a false belief 
and even lead us to the place of God's judgment. Can I say to you today that in this age of relativism and synchronism, when truth and error seems to all get mixed together, and it's hard sometimes to discern what's right and what's wrong, we need to be awake and alert to what is truth. We need to take a stand for purity. We need to take a stand for what is right. Truth is not necessarily hate speech. And saying that something is wrong is not necessarily intolerance. You see, tolerance means everybody has the right to their own view, and they have the right to peacefully express themselves. It does not mean that all views are right or that all views are equal. All views are not equal in validity or veracity. Jude says, you just need to know that there is a spiritual virus out there and we can be easily exposed to this contagious disease. So some people react by saying, oh, it's no big deal. I guess some people react to the present crisis in that fashion as well. There are others though that take the opposite extreme position and they say, everybody's sick. The problem is everywhere. Almost everybody is wrong except for us. We are the only ones that have the real truth. These people sometimes become super sensitive about error, become hypercritical. They become cynical and skeptical about everything. So for example, there's a misuse of a spiritual gift. These people are prone to say, well, then let's just shut it down altogether. Let's forbid all spiritual gifting. When the real answer is to discern what is right and what is from God and to correct that which is a misuse. Some people look at a television evangelist who is a phony and come to the conclusion that every television evangelist must be a hypocrite. You can't believe anything they say. But I, I think we need to listen to spiritual presentations much the same way that we eat fish. We need to eat the meat and spit out the bones. May the Lord give us that kind of discernment. There are some people who hear a preacher who says something they don't like and they come to the conclusion, why well, I don't think that preacher is even a Christian. I don't think he knows the Lord. They are so nervous about error. They're so tense that even if God shows up, they cry foul. So we need to avoid these two extremes. I just want to say that we need to check our own lives and take the two by four out of our own eye before we start working on the speck of sawdust that might be in someone else's eye. I know there are some bad, bear, bad apples out there, but let's not throw out the whole barrel. Let's, as they say, not throw out the baby with the bath water. So what was the real problem that Jude addressed? Well, I'd like to read my text at this point. It's in the book of Jude, beginning to read at verse 17 through to verse 23. But dear friends, remember what the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ foretold. They said to you, in the last times there will be scoffers who will follow their own ungodly desires. These men are ones who divide you, who follow mere natural instincts, and do not have the Spirit of God. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. Be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them, and to others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing that has been stained by corrupted flesh. I'm glad that he starts this portion with the words, dear friends. You see, Jude is not mad at the whole world. He doesn't have a burr under his saddle. He's not just bad spirited. He didn't just get up on the wrong side of the bed. He's not just in a bad mood. He is genuinely concerned about the welfare of these people. He doesn't hate everyone. He just wants to make sure that they are not misled into error. 
And so actually three times in this short book, he calls them dear friends. Now here's the problem. In verses 18 and 19, it says, they will divide you. This does not mean so much they will necessarily divide you one from another, but they are making distinctions in the church or in the body of Christ. They are saying, we are the super spiritual ones. We are the elite. In fact, we are so spiritual that we can even sin in our bodies and it doesn't affect the purity of our souls. They are using their spiritual freedom as a license for licentiousness that they feel like they can sin, but it's okay because they are in a class above. So the author is saying, don't start classifying yourselves as those who are super spiritual, those who are class A, class B, and class C. Don't divide yourself in that way. These false teachers are saying, it's okay for them to let their flesh do whatever it wants to do. And Jude concludes that they are following their natural animal instincts and they are following ungodly desires so their behavior betrays them but so does their speech because Jude says they scoff at the things of God second Peter Peter in his book the second letter that he wrote actually says something very similar he says in the last days scoffers will come who will say where is the sign of his coming and actually, this is one of the signs of the last days, that people will heap scorn upon religion, and they will laugh at the teaching of the Bibles. The, the scripture also says that they will actually deny the Lord Jesus. But the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 9, says, If you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and if you will believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. But these people are denying the lordship of Jesus. Their speech has betrayed them. Jude says in verse 8 that these dreamers have polluted their bodies. They slander celestial beings and they reject authority. They do not desire to be appointed accountable to anyone. They will not submit to God ordained authority. So what's the answer? What's the antidote for this contagion? How do we protect ourselves from this kind of problem? Sometimes it's a lot easier to identify the problem than it is to come up with a viable solution. So I want to share with you several things that Jude leaves with us that will help us to build up and to strengthen our immune system against the spiritual virus that would destroy us. In verse 17, he says, remember. Remember what the apostles foretold. These things that are happening to us should not take us totally by surprise. They should not unduly alarm us. God knew about all of these things a long time ago. Somebody has said that the only thing that we really learn from history is that we don't learn very much from history. Uh, one college professor by the name of Franklin Jones said, anybody who thinks that a poor student cannot change the course of history has never marked history exam papers. So some people come up with some rather interesting interpretations. Somebody says, if we don't learn from history, then we are doomed to repeat it. The reason that most uh, history often repeats itself is because the people weren't listening very carefully the first time. So what do we learn about history from the book of Jude? Well, first of all, we learn that God is faithful in keeping his promises. His promises are that are positive, are faithful and true, but so also is his promise that punishment will come to those who deny the Lord and turn their back on God. For example, he uses the nation of Israel. God saved them from slavery in the country of Egypt, but they perished in the wilderness because of their disobedience and their unbelief. He uses the illustration of angels who were cast out of heaven because they rebelled against the authority of God. Because they rebelled, 
they were expelled. And then he uses the example of Sodom and Gomorrah, who gave themselves up to sexual impurity and to perversion, and they were punished by God for their sin and consumed by fire. In verse 11 of Jude, he says, Woe to these false teachers, for they have followed the way of Cain. Well, who was Cain? In Genesis chapter 4, we read his story that he thought he could make up his own rules about approaching God. He wanted to substitute his own plan of self-salvation in, in substitute for the way of God. And then it says, remember Balaam. His story is told to us in Numbers chapter 22 to 24, where he sold out to greed. He was conquered by covetousness and became governed by greed. And Jude says, beware of that in your own life. He was a bad example. And then finally, he uses the example of Korah in the wilderness, who rebelled against God's authority, and the earth opened up and swallowed him. Quite a severe punishment, but it just illustrates that God will deal with sin. He loves the sinner, but God will not stand for sin. And he warns these uh, readers that this false teaching also will open them up to potential sin. He says these false teachings are like reefs that are hidden beneath the surface of the sea, but are capable of bringing our spiritual life to a place of shipwreck. So remember the examples of the past. Learn the record, lessons of historical record. See, everybody makes mistakes. It's just that smart people don't repeat them. Then secondly, he says, build yourself up in the most holy faith. Well, that's fine, Jude, for you to say that, but how do we do that? Well, first of all, we have to eat properly. Some of us have a, a diet problem in more ways than one, but right now I'm talking about our spiritual diet. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The psalmist knew this truth, in Psalm 1, he says that the righteous person delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, and also the central chapter in the Bible, says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. We will be stronger in our faith when we are stronger in the word of God. And then we need to feed our minds the right kind of material. The book of Philippians chapter 4 says, whatever is pure, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whichever is, is uh, good, think on these things. There's an expression that says, garbage in, garbage out. And so we need to feed our minds and our spirits with the right kind of spiritual food. And then... Jude says, we are to contend for the faith in verse 3. Faith in this verse does not mean, it's not an action word like it is sometimes in the Bible. Quite often in the Bible, faith is something that we have to do. But here faith means the truth of God's word, the truth of scripture, the teaching of the apostles. And it says we have to be prepared to defend this truth. But friends, how can we defend the truth if we don't know what it is? So first of all, we need to be strong in God's word. And we need to be careful that it really is the truth of God that we are defending. Sometimes we can get very defensive and very offensive by defending things that are nothing more than personal opinion or our own opinion. This is a holy faith, Jude says, because it comes from a holy God and it talks about a holy Jesus and it's inspired by a Holy Spirit. Notice that he says, build yourselves up. He uses the plural because friends, we really are better together. We do need one another. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 says, don't forget the assembling or the meeting of yourselves because we do encourage and we do strengthen one another. Now I know that under the present circumstances, this is not only difficult, sometimes impossible. But my exhortation, my encouragement to you today is 
even though we may be separated physically, let's not separate ourselves socially from one another. Thank the Lord we do have social means of connecting. A hundred years ago, or even 20 years ago, this would not have been possible. But today, we can stay connected. So don't forget to keep in touch with friends and family. Even though we are better together, this responsibility of building ourselves up is a personal responsibility. We are responsible for our spiritual welfare. We cannot blame others. We need to learn to feed ourselves. We need to learn the discipline of spiritual exercise. You cannot depend simply upon a Sunday morning sermon to carry you through the whole week. We need to daily feed ourselves and become strong. The Apostle Paul said to his young protege, Timothy, that physical exercise has some benefit, but spiritual exercise benefits us not only in this life, but also in the life to come. So we need the discipline of spiritual exercise, and we need to build on a good foundation. Remember, almost anybody can tear something down, but it takes a craftsman to build something up. And we need to learn to be people who build one another up, not tear one another down. Then Jude says, we need to build ourselves up by praying in the Holy Spirit. He's referring to the ability to pray under the direction of the Holy Spirit and to pray under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But he's also referring to here to the ability of us believers to pray in the Holy Spirit. In other words, to allow the Holy Spirit to pray through us. Those who have the prayer language of tongues can use it to build themselves up because the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4 that we build ourselves up through praying in the Spirit. When I was home from the mission field where we were missionaries in Thailand for eight years, I had the privilege of traveling with Reverend, Reverend Bernard Hunter. He was a veteran missionary who had served many years in South Africa as a chaplain to the miners that were working in the gold mines. And he told me of a, an occasion when he went to a meeting with his African brothers and they got into this terrible disagreement. He said they were cursing one another, they were calling each other all kinds of names. And when he finally left the meeting at midnight, he went home to his wife and said, dear, pack the suitcase, we're going home. We've been here all these years and they haven't learned anything from us yet. They're still fighting like cats and dogs, like unbelievers. And he said, we're going home. But he couldn't sleep, so he got up in the middle of the night and he started to pray. And he prayed in the language of the Spirit. And just like the Bible promises, he built himself up in his faith. And in the morning, his wife said, well, do you want to get the suitcases? He said, forget the suitcases. We're not going home. God has given me the strength and the courage to carry on. It's interesting to notice that this verse in Jude is in the present participle tense of the verb. It says, keep on praying. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't give up. And friends, coronavirus is a good time to focus on our prayer life. Mm -hmm. You see, this is a spiritual battle, I believe, as well as a medical battle. And intellectual pursuits alone will never win the victory in the realm of the Spirit. We need to be people of prayer. And then he says, also keep yourself in the love of God. Now, we have a responsibility to do this. But he said, but, but back in verse 1, Jude said, well, God loves us. Well, that's true. He does love us. He loves everyone. But this verse means, let's keep ourselves within the boundaries where the love of God can be freely expressed, freely received, freely and fully appropriated and appreciated. God's love is special when it's recognized by those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord. And the apostle uh, Jude here says that those who are keeping themselves in God's love 
are waiting and looking and watching for the Lord's return. And the final mercy that God will extend to us is he will open the doors of eternity for us that we may be with him forever. Jesus says in John chapter 15, verse 10, if you keep or obey my commands, then you will remain in my love. We can never escape the love of God. It will follow us wherever we go. But only those who accept God's love will fully enjoy the benefits or the blessings. So Jude's encouragement is, live in the reality and the assurance of God's loving presence in your life every day. So let me summarize what Jude has shared with us. First of all, remember and learn from the lessons of history. Secondly, build yourself up in the most holy faith through the Word of God, through fellowship, and through prayer. And then keep yourself in the love of God. And finally, he closes by saying, let's help one another. In verse 22, be merciful to those who doubt, those who are wavering, those who are confused, those who aren't certain what to believe and what not to believe because of these false teachers. The teachers, these false teachers have confused them and they are now uncertain. So gently and lovingly bring them back into the realm and the path of truth. We have to make room for the, Tra the Thomases of our faith, the people who have doubts. It's okay to doubt God. It's just not okay to refuse the answer when God gives it to us. And it's not okay to reject his truth when we know it. Then secondly, he says, there are others that you have to snatch like brands from the fire. They are on the precipice of destruction. This is a time to act directly, decisively, and quickly. We need to warn them and to snatch them as quickly as we possibly can because they are on the verge of going uh, the wrong way. And then the third group are those who are deeply immersed into immorality. Even their clothes, Jude says, are, is stained, are stained with corruption. Pray that God will be merciful to them, but be careful and be on guard that you yourself do not get infected. This is a good time for us to apply the six foot rule or the two meter rule. What Jude is saying is don't avoid these people totally. Don't ignore them, but be careful that you don't get sucked into the same error that they are in. Their corruption can be contagious. Their depravity can make them infectious. So we don't want to get too friendly with the sin that they are connected to. Reach out to them, love them, try to help them, but be on guard for your own soul's well-being and don't get overly friendly with sin. I want to close this morning with some Bible verses. First of all, the last verse in the book of James says, remember this, whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save him from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. And then Peter says that in the last days there will be many who will scoff. But he closes this and says, Dear friends, be on your guard so that you will not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but instead grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. The Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 12 says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do want to pray this morning for those who have been infected by this virus. But we also want to pray for those who are in danger of contamination from a spiritual virus, from error, from false teaching that would lead them astray from the truth of your word and lead them away from enjoying the fullness of your love and your presence in their lives. Lord, we just want to once again this morning remember those who are standing in special need. If there's someone listening, Lord, that has a prayer need, 
I pray in the name of Jesus that you will meet them where they are at. Even though we are separated spiritually, uh, physically, spiritually, we agree that you are the God who can help us. And so, Lord, we just want to commit this day and the coming days to you. And we pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will keep us all in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for uh, being with us this morning. Uh, remember to wash your hands, avoid crowds, and take due care, but also remember God is able to keep us and he has not given us over to the spirit of fear. You are in good hands when you are in the hands of God. And may the peace of God guard and keep our minds and souls pure in his sight. Announcements? Just a, a closing announcement. Uh, we will not be having public services for the remainder of March, but you can hear a daily devotion at 8.30 in the morning as Pastor West will share with us via social media. And uh, you can uh, give online. And uh, I'm getting signals here. Prayer here. We oh, and we will have the prayer chapel open every day from 11 to noon that you can come and we'll keep our distance from one another, but we will pray and seek the Lord because prayer does make a difference. Thank you for being with us. God bless you. Bye for now.